Okay, call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners, April 18th, 515. Uh, Joanne, can we do a roll call? Sure. Here. Commissioner Ernst. Here. Commissioner Williams. Commissioner Vogelson. And Commissioner Wright. Um, changes to the agenda. Yes, we have some changes to the agenda, just one. Um, for the public and all the people online, we are going to add a public comment um, session after the Miller Leg presentation, in addition to the one that's first. So if you have public comment on the Miller Leg presentation afterwards, you can do so afterwards as well. Um, and just a reminder to all the commissioners, please be sure to turn on your mics because it's hard for people online to hear us when we don't. So be sure to do that. And any other changes? No? Um, okay, so approval of the minutes of the previous board meeting held on April 4th at 5.15. Nope, roll call. Commissioner Ernst? Commissioner Engel? Commissioner Wellens? Yes. Commissioner Bobosai? Yes. And Commissioner Wright? Uh, uh, and we'll do public requests, which we just missed, if anybody wants to do a public request prior to the presentation. All right. Okay. Motion passed. Hello. Okay. Hi, guys. Hope everybody had a nice Passover and Easter. Um, Greg Galanis, 1780 Parkside Circle South, Book Raton, 33486. Um, I know it's a little surprising I'm getting up here before the survey, um, but I did want to make some observations. Um, I thought it was important. As um, most of you guys know, I'm president of the Boca Golf Association, representing all of the leagues in the city of Boca. Um, I'm also uh, president of the Men's Golf League that formed at the new Boca Golf and Racquet Club um, across the street from Costco, where we've got roughly 120 guys to play every week. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this survey process and where we're at. Um, I can't recall if this is the second or third survey we've done, but they all keep coming back with golf as a very strong contender or the lead uh, requested items. And, um, you know, I've been in the trenches with you guys and in this process for going on five years right now. Um, we have spent nearly $30 million of taxpayer money to date. Um, and the property, we've yet to begin any kind of development on it. Um, with the amount of land that we have available on the property, at least two, maybe three or four of the priority list can be accomplished very easily. There's plenty of room to do all of them. Um, we are likely looking at at least an additional five to $18 million uh, for development of this property. The only item on the list of priorities that is gonna generate any revenue is golf. Um, the new golf course, Boca Raton Golf and Racquet Club and Red Reef are presently at capacity. Every tee time, every day is sold out. There's no place to put any additional golfers. And neither course are equipped to serve the fastest growing segment of the golf business, which is the soon to be retiring uh, and aging community as well as our youth. Um, I think I've taken a few of you guys out there to show you um, our new golf course, which is wonderful. And the city's doing a good job with it. But I also showed you the great difficulty with the force carries um, and, and the things that make it non-playable for uh, the older community, as well as our youth. Um, so I will continue to um, suggest and request that our number one priority on this property is a quality short course, a lighted driving range and practice facility, putting course, and a teacher teaching and learning center. 
Um, I've sent you many articles, uh, one in particular this week that showed you the success and the growth of the short course with the limited amount of time that people have to play golf. As stewards of our tax dollars, it's incumbent on you to do the right thing fiscally on this property and have the courage and conviction to consider golf as the only significant revenue producing item on this property. Thank you very much. Anybody else here? Go ahead. Regina Eklund, 5201 Northwest 2nd Avenue. Um, first, I would like to thank you for considering um, having public comment after the survey presentation. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, I would like to first take uh, just a minute. There was an article that appeared in the Boca Magazine quoting Chairperson Wright. I don't mean this to be um, a negative comment, but there are a few things that I would seriously like to set the record straight on. Um, Commissioner Wright stated that um, normally we, you hear only from golfers at your regular board meetings. Well, there's a reason for that because we are the people who will show up and will support a golf course that's put on that property. If other people wanted something else, they should be here at your meetings. If they're not here, that should tell you they may not be the people that will support whatever you put on that property. Um, additionally, it was said that um, we seem to want anything that doesn't bring children. And I specifically want to set this record straight there. The demographics of the Boca Tico community are changing considerably. We are not a senior community. We have a lot of young families that have moved into our condos and we certainly want to see facilities for those families and for the children. Um, as Mr. Galenis said, there is adequate space on that property to accommodate many different things. So please understand the Boca Tico community in no way and the Boca Tica residents in no way wish to discriminate against children. It almost sounds like we're violating Fair Housing Act practices and that simply is not true. Um, there is still a predominant older adult community in Boca Tica and that is true and, and the people appreciate their quiet there. So that is why the request was made at your visioning meeting that we not have soccer fields, we not have ball fields in that community because it is surrounded by residential people, residential uh, community. Um, additionally, there was a comment that um, there's not going to be an 18 hole golf course on Boca Tica property because there is another golf course less than a mile away. To speak to that, to put ball fields on that Boca Tica property, there are ball fields two miles away at Dehernals. So that logic doesn't quite work there. Um, and other things that um, I'd like to just address. I can't play soccer or softball. I can golf. Golf is a lifelong sport and it can and should be played by children as well as adults. And it continu can continue to be played by those who are 70, 80, or even 90 years old. Um, I do wish that the blame would stop for the Boca Tica community in general. We fought to preserve green space surrounding our community. And we will continue to voice our concerns for safety, security, privacy, and the impact any plans will have on our community. Um, and, uh, I think that's all I have to say. I look forward to the survey presentation and thank you. Quick note on that. Um, if you watched our previous meeting, I did address mm -hmm. that article and um, I was 
mis my quotes were uh, mischaracterized. And um, so you can know that I, I do know that Boca Tica is a, has a wide variety of people living in it now. Um, and that I never said that, <laughs> that Boca Tica residents did not like children or families or anything of that sort. So just, mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Harold Chaffee. I live at 6200 Northwest 2nd Avenue. I'm the president of Keep Golf and Boca. You know, surveys are great. You know, I can sit in my coffee table early in the morning. I can get a, a survey delivered to me. I don't have to leave my home. I can fill it out. I can put a wish list in, maybe, maybe especially before Christmas, to hope that I can get the gift that I want. But the main thing is to see people attend meetings. We attend meetings to basically show you that we're dedicated to this and that this is what really you should be doing here. We give up our time, we come, we sit for two hours, we go up to the pulpit and make speeches. The last meeting we had, we had over 200 people, plus we, I don't know how many people we had online. And almost all of them you know, basically said that, that they would like to see a golf course here. I don't know how that works into the survey at all. And I hope it did go into the survey some way. I'm not sure how it did it. But, um, and the other thing too is, which going back, I'm sorry to do this, but about four weeks ago, Craig, you made a statement about the Boca Tica people not helping you with San Remo. Okay, that's not true. I was talking with John. John left, he was the president. When the new board took over, I arranged to be at the meeting. I was talking with them, how can we work this out? What can we do? Maybe we can split things in half, whatever. And then I was told to step out, that you're interfering with the plan. So we did. And I just want to make sure that we put that on the record that we did go, we did try, but I don't know what was going on behind scenes. So, you know, we didn't want to interview anything, so we backed out. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Jackie Glisman. I live at uh, Northwest 4th Avenue, 6231 Northwest 4th Avenue. And I just want to say, in the meantime, we resolve what is it going to be built, whether it's A or B or whatever. I would like to have uh, some kind of security around that uh, golf course, which is on the lake, because my, my house is right on the lake, so I get to see all of the people on the other side of the lake. And there are these um, early 20 year old guys that they like to, with the rifles and they shoot the iguanas. And if the birds are behind, you know, the big uh, um, birds, they shoot them too. Plus they are shooting across the lake. And my, my friend next door, uh, she has had to call the police a couple of times because they are shooting straight into her backyard where her small chihuahuas are at. So in the meantime, we resolve what to do. Would it be possible to strengthen up the, the security in that area? The, the fencing that surrounds that, that golf course on the north, northwest side is made out of these sticks that they are very easily taken away. You just slide them from one side or the other side and they will just drop. And then the vehicles come like these kids, you know, they're not kids, they're already in their twenties and they drive with their vehicles. They're just not walking and jaywalking into this private property, which is the golf course. They are actually driving with their big, uh, it's a, uh, a truck. It's a truck that they're driving with and, and after they're done shooting, they tear the land apart like, yeah, look at what we did. And they go slamming the wheels on one side and slamming the wheels on the other side, virtually destroying the place. Would it be possible to put at the least a sign or say no trespassing or, or something that can help people from just getting in there and do whatever they want, please? I feel, I feel I, if these guys shoot at my property across the lake, I may be injured because these are big rifles. And if I'm injured, where is the bullet coming from? Boca Beach and Park District. Right. So that's no good for none of us. 
please. If there are people on the property that have guns, you should definitely call the police. We can't. I that. did. We did put signs up today. We actually have a person out there today installing signs and cameras. So we're putting things up in place to try to deter some of that activity. But in the long run, the best thing to do, if somebody has a gun out there, call the Boca PD. That's the best thing to do. Yes, site. thank you. We already Both. done it twice. And Sergeant Shanahan told me directly that I should go to you because there is very little they can do unless they actually do something to my property or do something to myself. There's nothing much they can do because it is your guy's property. So it's a back and forth situation. We did add more signage today. So hopefully that will help deter some of it and cameras. So hopefully. Thank you so much. Rianne, can you can you um, provide us more of an update of the security of the of the site as well as the dates of this? Maybe during your manager comments or something. I don't have any police reports, but we'll talk to the police department and get copies of the reports of these incidents. So, yeah, so the the speaker's comments are well taken, but I think we need the dates and the times, and we need to follow up with them. And you know, for sure that the fencing, if the fencing is, is, is removable that easily removable, it should be secured and it can be screws, whatever. It cannot be dis dismembered like that. So that's, that's something we can improve upon. So. Good evening. My name is Mary Ann Winfield. I'm a resident at uh, Palms of Boca Tica Condo 10, 5280 Northwest 2nd Avenue, apartment 511. Um, personally, I've been a resident in that community since 1987, when I think uh, it's in its heyday, probably as a golf course and a community. Uh, over the last several years, the community has changed, as uh, one of your previous speakers mentioned. We have um, the pleasure of being an under 55 community, so we have several younger families there. And uh, on Friday, we actually had our first Easter egg hunt and egg coloring contest with the kids. The families that participated were from several countries from all around the world. Ironically, that is the mix that we do have at the uh, Palms at Boca Tica. I think we're represented by uh, about 20 different countries and many of them have their young children. So whatever is being considered for the future of the property, there are several things that uh, I, realized in reading some of the last remarks, I happen to also be a uh, founding member of an organization known as Smart Growth. And we have an organization locally, uh, Smart Growth Principles. And uh, as I read and looked at some of the uh, many considerations for the property, there's an opportunity here to uh, develop into the plans, Smart Growth Principles, which are several, 10 or 11 principles that can be followed. Many of them are, of course, keeping the green, uh, making it accessible for bikers, walkers. Uh, I also understand now a big effort is being made for skateboarders or roller skate or you know, skating people. So there's several opportunities here, maybe to create whatever else is being des designed, some opportunities for uh, young families as Howard had mentioned in one of his remarks, a Central Park area. Wouldn't it be nice if uh, there were some opportunities here to really utilize the property, make it a destination. This is a beautiful property where we are here. It's my first time in this particular location and it's incredible what we have in Boca Raton. So why not take advantage of this one opportunity and uh, add into it smart growth principles. I'll be glad to share more information with you on it, but uh, that was what I wanted to say. Thank you. Anybody else? Good afternoon, Anthony Sill Silberti, 6200 Northwest 2nd Avenue, Boca Raton, Florida. Um, here today to speak about, uh, I'm a real estate broker in New York and Florida. I'm also a real estate uh, I'm also a CPA, and this is known as the, what you would call the soft sell. Um, 
basically the elephant in the room is that and this contradiction of uh, different schools of thought on whether or not a deed restriction is uh, enforceable or not. Um, but there is a deed restriction on the property. The use is a uh, subject tract of land shall be used only for the purpose of a golf course facility. Duration, these restrictions are imposed in perpetuity. Something that's been uh, ignored or maybe not even known by many, probably even a lot of new owners, is that um, this deed restriction was so called, called, uncalled for. It was part of a social membership we paid for this. The Boca Tica residents had a social membership for the Boca Tica Country Club where portion of their common expenses were paid monthly. So, and this went on for years and years and years. So when this was over, when we didn't have to pay anymore, yeah, the Boca Tica Country Club, yeah, they, it, we, it wasn't supported. We were let down. The whole community was let down because when we supported, it was open. When we stopped supporting it financially, it closed. So I, I, I'm well aware of everyone has, you know, one for one vote and, and all this. But to think that the Boca Tica residents, their dots on a board may not represent more than a regular dot. Well, there's two schools of thought here. And this is like the soft sell. I own four units. My mom and dad own a fifth. I'm on four D to four units. I have a big financial interest in Boca Tica, and I'm not trying to impress you, but I'm trying to impress upon you that there will be a strong voice of what we think should be there. And maybe not everyone's aware of how much money we have put in over the years and years. Um, but I think it's something that should be addressed, hopefully in a, in a nice, uh, friendly manner and all that. I mean, I came up with the uh, North Park, formerly uh, Ocean Breeze, now North Park. A lot of good ideas in there. Hey, maybe you don't use any of them. That's fine. Please come up with better ones. But if you think, if anyone thinks they're just going to ram the ideas and say, well, this is, well, you know, we're, we're here, we're here to discuss, we're here to vote, and we're here to influence. And let's we're just hoping that it always comes down to uh, what is right and wrong. No one's going to take away people's rights. So hopefully they'll be addressed in the proper manner. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here? Good evening, Rick Hurd. Please unmute, state your name and address. You have five minutes. Hi, everybody. It's uh, can you hear me? Okay. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. It's Rick Hurd, two eighty five Northeast Spanish Court in Boca. I thank you for uh, taking my comments on Zoom. I happen to be out of town tonight. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend in person. Uh, I have had a chance to review parts of the presentation, and I just wanted to remind the commissioners that um, it was exactly one year and 13 days ago that I provided the commission with a proposal in response to the RFI. And that proposal that I provided was the result of speaking to the golf community and the Boca Tica resident community and trying to incorporate all the ideas that people had for the property. And I just wanted to remind you that in that proposal, I showed you how we can get just about everything that everybody wants on this property, including walking. I'm looking at the, um, the proposal that you're gonna be seeing from Miller Leg, but it includes walking trails, bicycle trails, nature preserve, playgrounds, a garden, open green space, golf, pickleball, tennis, dog park, mountain biking, um, my point is, is that you can have all of that on this property. And you already have one year ago, a plan that can show you a way to do it. And maybe that's not the only way, but it certainly can fit. And I just encourage the commissioners 
to, um, as Mr. Glennis said, you know, keep an open mind, have some courage and conviction, and let's go forward and start to move and get the property done. And the comments about the security are very troubling. And the best answer for security is to do something with this property rather than let it lie derelict. So thank you again for, for allowing me to comment. Thanks, Rick. Good evening, Mr. Ducate. Please unmute and state your name and address. You've got five minutes. Hello, Robert Ducate, 5351 Northwest Third Terrace. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Thank you, Greg. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, I've been working on this project for saving green space for 15 years. And I want to thank you all and on the board for doing that and purchasing the property. I also want to especially thank uh, you for irrigating and improving the uh, property, especially on the entrance and at the main intersection where most of us uh, go by. I see the sprinklers irrigation system going on. It looks much, much better. Obviously, uh, this is a first step in improving the property overall. But I can also uh, remind you that I have been the biggest advocate for golf, and I actually wanted to have a 27-hole golf course uh, until, of course, the city bought the nearby or acquired the nearby golf course of Boca Country Club. And for those who aren't aware, uh, the uh, Beach and Park District Board has, um, on many occasions, uh, gone to the city about having a golf course uh, on this property. And the agreement is that the city must approve uh, whatever is built on the golf course. And on repeated attempts, the city has not approved and made it clear that they were not going to approve a golf course. Uh, I can also, uh, I have one question for the uh, people uh, at Miller Leg is how high will the nets need to be uh, between the uh, railroad tracks and your proposed or possible uh, golf uh, amenities on the east side of the golf course or wherever you might have a golf course and especially a driving range. For those people who haven't been to West Palm Beach Drive Shack or to a top golf anywhere around the country, uh, these typically have 100 foot high nets, which I can assure you are not going to enhance your views behind the condos. Uh, many that currently support a golf course or a driving range. I've talked to many of these uh, neighbors on the east side, and I can tell you that many of them want to keep it as it is. Uh, of course, that's not going to happen. And I think that uh, some type of uh, passive recreational uh, opportunity might be appropriate for or some other type of uh, athletic facility. Uh, in the past, uh, there were local cross country teams that were using the east side for cross country as well as I think the west side. So there are a lot of things. I have not seen a copy of the uh, presentation, but I wanted to clarify that uh, for people who continually uh, ask for a golf course, as has been stated before, these people need to go to the city council uh, because uh, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, you know, is. Uh, not very, um, not very smart from a uh, long-term standpoint. But thank you for your cooperation and all your attention to uh, the Boca Tica area. Thanks, Robert. If there's anybody else on the line, press star nine to raise your hand. Hello, um, my name's Dave Bracknell. I've been in, uh, I live in Boca Square. I've been here for about 35 years, grew up in South Florida, okay? Uh, about three years ago, I visited a, my brother in California and he took me out to play uh, a game called disc golf. And basically it's Frisbee, but they're smaller. And what you do is you throw these things at baskets. It's played just like ball golf, 
it's addictive. Ask my wife. She never sees me. I'm always out playing this. So that's probably a good thing. But anyway, I, I came here. I, I did send in a proposal that it could be incorporated into this plan too. You guys probably, I think it's last year around March, but I was here today uh, to present the possibility of maybe getting it in one installed in Sugar Sand Park. Uh, this golf is inexpensive to install and get going and to maintain for the city. For players, this costs anywhere from $8 to $20. So it's very inexpensive. Kids, adults, older folks can play it. You can have a championship course or you can have, it's just like regular golf. You can have, you have three tee pads usually for beginners, advanced and uh, intermediates. Uh, so basically you throw the disc at, uh, at baskets. Now I walked the Sugar Sand Park and I, I proposed this about two years ago. So I was gonna get involved in it, then COVID started. So I kind of didn't do it. There is a disc golf community out there. there. I belong to the Broward County Disc Golf Association because I always play at Tradewinds Park or Quiet Waters Park. The closest disc golf park to the Boca area is Del Rey. Uh, and that's a beautiful course too. If you guys have never tried it, try it. You might get addicted, so be careful. But the talking points here is it's, uh, in the, it's inexpensive to install. Maintenance is basically nothing. The same things you have to do for the park. Uh, I, I was actually on the phone today with uh, one of the the uh, top designer in the country for disc golf. And I said, just give me an estimate how much you would charge. And they would charge, uh, they said $25,000 to $35,000 to design the course. Total to build the course at Sugar Sand Park should be about $50,000 max. It could be as low as $25,000, depending on who you have designing it. If I design it or something like that, it really isn't that hard. Basically you clear out some brush, uh, and you make some fairways and the people playing golf take care of it. I helped build the course in trade winds. It's called trade woods. When they first did it, they brought these big machines that just tore up all the made fairways. And I said, this isn't going to work. And the guy says, just wait a couple of years. It's now one of the premier courses in South Florida. Everyone comes to play trade woods from Miami, from West Palm beach. Uh, the disc golf community will gladly help maintain the course. We do it all the time. I volunteer every other weekend and I'm helping clean up courses and clearing branches and stuff. But I was just saying, it's something that families, kids, adults, golfers, as they get older, a lot of people, they start playing uh, disc golf. I play golf. My wife is pretty good at golf. I'm pretty bad at it, but I'm pretty good at disc golf. So, and so it's kind of funny. I play disc golf. She plays regular golf. Uh, she spends $7,500 every time she plays. I spend zero unless I lose a disc. <laughs> uh, but it, it's a great sport. It's addictive. It's something families can do. And it's something you can do now at Sugar Sand Park. I mean, you can go in, you could have this done in three months. It's not that hard. It's pretty simple. Uh, a good friend of mine that I play disc golf with every now and then, he's built three or four courses, I can't remember, in Broward County. He... He says, you know, I, I'm not going to get involved, but then it bothered him. So it's funny. He called me up yesterday and said, I walked the course. This is a great place to get a disc golf course in Sugar Sand Park. Now, I don't know if there's any uh, restrictions on where you could put it, but the northern end just south of Palmetto Park Road is great. Between the baseball fields, it's like a walking area there. I, I went there just out of curiosity, and I spent four or five hours just walking around, riding my bike, I saw one person using that area. If you put disc golf in it, you will have disc golfers coming in, families, people just throwing the disc and just enjoying nature. It's a great, if you guys haven't walked Sugar Sand Park, it's great. You walk through it and it's neat. You can be out in nature for, you know, a couple hours throwing the disc around and have fun. So that's just my pitch. If, if there's interest, uh, I think my name and address and email is there. I, be happy to help spearhead it and lead anything that you need done for it. I'd even help design the course if you'd rather go that route. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Is it Dave? Yeah. Dave, um, does that require open space or is it mostly within trees? It's, uh,
hard, it, it's physically difficult to work with the people. Thank you, Dave. All right, any other comment? Um, we will close public requests and we'll move on to our regular business. Um, Miller Leg presentation. All right, good evening. And um, well, first by introductions, I'm Mike Kroll with Miller Leg and Lumi Fuentes uh, with Miller Leg also. We also have online um, Ethan Adams from RRC who uh, constructed and conducted the, uh, the actual online as well as the uh, the statistically valid survey. So if there's any questions regarding that or anything from the, from the commissioners, uh, he'd be able to answer that. So um, just kind of get started. And I guess I wanna first preface this is that this presentation is um, a presentation of what we're proposing as the program for ocean breeds. And what that means is what are the elements that we're looking to put on ocean breeds? It's not simply a report out of the survey itself, it's taking everything we've done over the last, and I guess kind of from November here. So here's kind of a schedule. Here's a schedule of, of where we are in the project. And, and you don't need to take pictures of this. This will be posted online after this. So it'll be posted on the website. So everybody's got access to the website that's specifically for Ocean Breeze. Um, but you know, we started this back in November of last year. And from them, then through uh, end of March, pretty much, we did a lot of inventory and analysis. And what that was, was gathering information. And gathering information was the workshop that we did, was interviews that we conducted with the city, with the district. Um, we also met with some focus groups um, on that. We also reviewed the RFIs that were submitted to the district and then also the uh, needs assessment that was done by the city uh, for their parks and recreation. So we, we looked at a bunch of stuff. It wasn't just the survey that we've done from then. So this is just kind of a, the schedule that we had put together that we're targeting by the end of this year to have this master plan you know, implemented and, and uh, accepted um, to make sure you know, prior to probably September, we're gonna be uh, preparing that and have it accepted in uh, September, October of this year. Um, so here's where we are right now. So what we've, oh boy, I can't touch the screen, can I? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we've gone through um, all the documentation and all the interviews. We conducted the visioning workshop and that work, visioning, visioning workshop was great. You know, Lumi will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and then this is where we kind of take everything and put it together and come up with some suggestions, okay? So that's where we are in the process. So as I mentioned, when we developing this program, it really considered a bunch of input from different entities. Everything, like I mentioned, from the district itself, um, from the city, we sat down with all the city commissioners and the city, uh, the mayor and the parks and rec folks. Um, we also sat down with the golf association and keep golf in Boca. Um, we did the statistically valid survey as well as the open access uh, survey, which is open to everybody. Um, and then uh, let's see what else. Um, and those are kind of, and then obviously the public workshop. Okay. So that's how all this information kind of got put in. And from that, um, these are the things, these are the folks that we talked to. Um, like I mentioned, the district, the needs assessment that the district had done previously. Uh, the RFIs that were submitted to the district, uh, 89 of those, um, and then talked to the executive director, the commissioners, and the attorney as well uh, with the district. Uh, the Boca, city of Boca, we met with the mayor as well as all the council members and the parks and rec uh, uh, director. The golf association and keep uh, golf in Boca, we met with them, had a good, uh, good discussion with them, a good uh, workshop with them. Then our public workshop, we had uh, almost 200 participants and it was great. Uh, it was 120 in, in the actual space itself or kind of squeezed in, in the space. And then we had over 70 people online that were, that were act, uh, you know, engaging in that workshop also. Um, 
Then we also had the statistically valid survey. We sent out 5,000 uh, uh, surveys. We got back 566. That is awesome. Doesn't sound like much, but over 10% is great. Uh, in many communities right now, we're struggling to get 5%. So there's interest, there's people who are uh, you know, interested and really active in the decision-making process of, of this. And then the open access or the open link uh, survey, we had 655 people respond to that. So again, you know, we had a great number of people participate in this process and to get us kind of where we are right now. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lumi and she's gonna tell you kind of what came out of uh, addressing all those different parties. So first year, I'm gonna explain a little bit of what you're gonna be seeing in the next couple of slides. You'll see uh, a list from highest priority um, on down and then you'll see a pictogram. Can you hear me? So then you'll see a bubble diagram um, in which the bigger the bubble, the higher the interest or the bigger uh, of the priority. You'll see uh, a continuous, the same program element in the same color and then in the same icon. So I'll start off with the RFIs in which we uh, reviewed and analyzed 89 responses from there. And we took a look and see what were the top priorities from there. So from that, we got a golf course, this golf, trails, pickleball, golf training facility, tennis, to so all the way to dog park. Okay. So then we took a look and analyzed the needs assessments and every component um, from that. So this needs assessment was conducted by the city of Boca Raton um, and it was uh, held by pros and it was uh, finalized back in last year, 2021. So from here, you'll see um, kind of a, it was a mixture of the market index, potential market index, you'll see um, as well survey. They had a statistically valid survey as well as an open survey. And then you'll just see um, the information that they gathered throughout this. So some of the top elements uh, for programming was a nature preserve, trails, event space, yoga, community center, all the way down to baseball. But you could start seeing some of these colors and some of the consistency between um, the F, RFI and the needs assessment throughout. And here we take a look at the beach uh, and park district in which we met with our fellow commissioners as well as with Grianne and her staff um, and from here and her attorney. And these were some of the lists um, bearing from all the way from trails, pickleball, the golf course, open green space, community center, recreation center and all the way down to even uh, a lake or water bodies. Okay. And while we met with the city, um, this was the mayor as well as the council members and the uh, recreation director and give us great input and we were able to analyze their priorities and more frequent comments. Um, priorities were from open green space, indoor tennis and pickleball, basketball trails, nature preserve, all the way down to playgrounds. And then we met with the golf association and the Keep Golf in Boca program, a um, very productive meeting in which we got some of their inputs, um, starting from a golf training facility, a learning center, a golf course, a putting green uh, course, um, a restaurant slash cafe, open green space and fishing. And then I know I see some familiar faces from the workshop and I'm glad to see you guys here. Uh, workshop was very successful. We had almost 200 um, members virtually and in person. Um, and it was a great mix to see all these great uh, elements and programming prioritized. So top of our list would be a golf course, golf training facility, driving range, restaurant cafe, uh, lake water bodies, uh, nature preserve, and then all the way down to picnic areas were some of the programming elements um, from the workshop. Okay, and we take a look at the statistically uh, valid survey in which uh, from here, you're able to see their top priorities um, from trails, cycling, event space, uh, which will be farmers market, our shows, nature preserve, playground, all the way down to volleyball. And I'm not sure if you're noticing, but some of these are kind of 
the priorities might change, move up and down, but you see a lot of consistency throughout. And with our open link, um, very similar to or statistically valid, just the priorities change. Um, open link was run from the beginning, both of them were run from February to March. Um, great input on that. And we see trails, training facility range, golf course, fitness, trails, cycling, multi-purpose uh, trails, all the way down to a splash pad. And then, you know, we took back and we had eight components to analyze, right? So how do you categorize these? Well, we took our analysis of this and came up with a point system of highest priorities equally across the board. And then we're able to come up with our list of programming for ocean breeze. So with the beginning of it, it would be uh, trails, golf course, a nature preserve, golf training, facility driving range, open green space, community center slash recreation center, cycling, pickleball, multi-purpose fields, playground, restaurant, cafe, tennis, public art, picnic areas, botanical butterfly garden, community garden, dog park, indoor tennis, pickleball, swimming pools, event space. Came in in the top 20 of, of the party list. And then with that, Mike is going to go over some of these elements. So, so again, the way we analyzed this was anything that made it to one of these lists here got more 10% or more of the votes or uh, participation from the from the votes uh, from the folks that were activated or, or involved in that process. Okay. So none of those things are just it got one vote from one person went on. So we really wanted to make sure this was a true prioritization of, of, the, of the program elements here. Um, so as, as Lumi said, we, we, we looked at those elements and, and here's the program that we're proposing. And what we see is that there's really five areas that these pro proposed program elements fit in. And this first one is, um, is passive. We have passive type uses. Um, so passive use is trails. Again, these are trails that would be shared trails and be able to be used by a variety of people, bicyclists, walkers, runners, rollerbladers, those types of things, so trails. Um, cycling was another, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not a little bit taller. Um, uh, cycling was, uh, was another thing. And again, this is uh, more passive cycling where the family go out and ride, uh, not really so much the folks in, uh, in their Lycra and such that would be out here, but more people in a, in a passive type of strolling uh, uh, cycling exercise. Um, nature preserve. Uh, again, these are natural areas that we want to make sure that we integrate throughout the, throughout the project. And these can be areas that can be educational, recreational, as well as interpretive for our unique uh, ecosystem here in South Florida. And it can also become a, a critical part of our stormwater system. We talked about some smart growth and, and those types of things. Being able to integrate that into in the stormwater requirements and such really is a, a great way to, to do that. Um, other passive areas are open green spaces, informal areas that you can go out and have a picnic, kick the ball around with the kids, throw the Frisbee with the kids, uh, those types of things. Uh, so again, open green space. This also can provide a buffer between our residences and, and other, other uh, uh, areas within the park. Picnic areas, again, kind of part and associated with those passive areas. And then botanical, butterfly, as well as community gardens. These are places that people come and uh, can actively you know, participate in things, but are, are very passive in nature. Um, and then the final one was public art. Uh, Boca has a great history of you know, integrating art into your recreational areas and such. Um, we look to continue that. And that's something that the, even the city is very uh, supportive of. Um, the next thing, next thing we wanted to talk about was uh, different types of spaces was social spaces. We talked about the multi-generational population now of uh, Boca Tica area. Playgrounds will be uh, integral to make sure our children don't have to go somewhere to, to go on playgrounds. They can go here and, and enjoy a playground within Ocean Breeze. Dog Park is another uh, potential use uh, within this area. Again, families come, they have dogs. These are, these are ways to... Um, 
control that and, and control where the dogs are and such and, and make it an amenity and a, and a show, social space for uh, ocean breeze. Also, Lumi talked about event spaces. These are more uh, general open spaces that are programmed and designed in such a way that they can support different events. They may have electric, they may have different types of uh, infrastructure put in them that most of the time, 99% of the time, you don't even know is there. But when an event comes, we've planned for it. They don't have to bring generators in. There's things there that it minimizes the disruption with the community, but offers a great, uh, great place for, for people to gather for these art shows, uh, festivals, et cetera. And the third, uh, third group is golf. We talked about that, uh, a golf course, a golf course that really is playable by all, um, our seniors, our youth, our teens, to really uh, encourage this. And it's complementary to what we have at uh, Boca Golf and Rack. And then in support of that, golf training facility, driving range. Again, we talked about this a, a little bit uh, with our golf group and even in the workshop extensively, that this is critical, again, with, uh, with enjoyment and, and, and continuing the game and the, and the history here at, uh, at Ocean Breeze Boca Tica. The fourth element was indoor spaces. There was a big uh, demand for indoor spaces. Obviously here in South Florida, we always can't be outside all the time and enjoy uh, uh, our, our weather. In the winter, it's nice, but in the middle of summer in the thunderstorms, et cetera, it's, it's, uh, it can be a challenge. But also a community center is a, is a place for gathering, uh, for different types of recreation, uh, meeting rooms, uh, different types of recreation, such as yoga or, or Zumba, those types of things. Teen rooms, where can our teens go? Um, you know, they, a lot of things are, are tied to esports, um, connectivity and things of that nature. So that's something else that this would offer. And a gym. Uh, a lot of people enjoy working out in a gym and that was one of the things that came out in, the, uh, in many of the uh, engagements that we had in public engagement. Also, one of the things, uh, indoor space was a restaurant or a cafe. Um, there was a, a, obviously if there was a golf, but also, uh, you know, just from the community's perspective, that they would enjoy maybe some place to just uh, have a casual meal or something of that nature. So we thought that this is a great, uh, great opportunity to uh, have that at uh, at Ocean Breeze, and it, you know, it can be designed in such a way that even events could be uh, supported there and such to really build that community sense of community for uh, for Ocean Breeze. Oops, doesn't like that one. There it is. Okay. Also, um, indoor tennis or pickleball. Um, that was something else that was, uh, that was discussed and, and brought up quite, quite extensively with the continued growth of, of pickleball. That's an opportunity. Uh, again, it's something that can be done inside. It can be done at all hours during all times of the year. So that's something that can be done. In addition, flexibility with other uh, indoor spaces. This picture on the, uh, on the bottom right is actually on a basketball court. So programming an indoor athletic space that could support pickleball and these racket sports also. And then we have active uses. Active uses could be inside, outside, but active use with pickleball was very, very highly rated. And obviously you see there's a lot of momentum with that sport takes up a little bit, uh, much less space than, than tennis um, and is very active by all members of uh, very cross-generational uh, participation in that sport. Tennis continued to get uh, good input um, uh, from all the parties. Multi-purpose fields. This is something that, uh, again, there was a, a request to, to make sure that this was considered. And, and this looks like the community is, is uh, interested in, in having more of these type multi-purpose fields that could have flexible type uses within the, within the community. And as you see, as you're getting more families there, there will be people who will be able to use this type of facility from your nearby residents. And finally, swimming pools and splash pads were some other type of amenities that, that were talked about to, to potentially be at Ocean Breeze. I'm active. So as I, as I mentioned, there really are five categories that the program that we're here presenting tonight and presenting to the, to the district to get your input on. Um, there are passive uses, the ones that we talked about, trails, cycling, nature preserve or nat natural areas, open green spaces, um, picnic areas, as well as botanical and butterfly gardens and community gardens, um, as well as public art, integrating public art into the, into the thing, into the area. 
um, social gathering spaces, such as uh, playgrounds, dog parks, event spaces, uh, those are critical. And then from a golf perspective, a golf course, as well as a training and driving range facilities, indoor uh, community center that would have flexible type uses in it, um, as well as recreation uses, a restaurant or cafe incorporated into this uh, into the program, and potentially indoor pickleball and tennis uh, associated with other athletic facilities indoor. And then finally active, and we kind of did this active as outdoor active, um, that would be pickleball, multi-purpose uh, fields, uh, tennis, as well as swimming pools. So we're gonna stop there because I'm sure there'll be some questions and uh, 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 you know, comments and such. So that's kind of where we are. You can kind of see we didn't build this. This is really based upon an, the extensive amount of public outreach that was done as part of this process because really these master planning processes, we can come in and say this is what we think is there, but really this really reflects what the community has told us that, uh, that they would like to desire and they desire to have at Ocean Breeze. So with that, uh, Brianne, or Brianne, I'll stop and I'll go from there. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask the commission, do we want to do public comment first or do we want to have a discussion first? Anybody have any? Uh, I think maybe we should do public comment first. Let, uh, let the public uh, come, come up and ask their questions and give their comments. Okay. And just to reiterate to the questions from Miller Leg. They will do their best to answer your questions, but they might not have answers for you tonight straight away. Start if I can. Right, and they have to be on the microphone to answer your questions if you do want an immediate answer from them. <laughs> Testing. Okay. My name is Dottie Provenzano. I live at 5961 Northwest Second Avenue, Boca Tica. This is, this sounds amazing. Sounds wonderful. Sounds like a little bit of everything of what everyone wants. So my question is, are, are these pipe dreams? I mean, is there money that would support all of this? You know, we've heard for over the years, I've been a part of Keep Golf in Boca that yes, we wanted it, but we know that the city held the purse strings for the whole West side. So has that been resolved? I mean, do you have, go ahead to do some of these things. <laughs> Hi again. All right. I live in Northwest 4th Avenue. Jackie Glissman, thank you. And that is a dead end street, which has around 30 houses, like 15 on one side and 15 on the other side. All of our backyards face the golf course. On the other side, there is another street that is Northwest 64, I think. It's okay. It's also a dead end street with about also 15 houses on one side and 15 on the other side. And they all have their backyards facing to the, to the golf course. Same way on the other side, Northwest 13th Terrace, third terrace. And I, I, I am uh, concerned if, if they decide on doing a, um, a dog park, that's going to be a disaster because everybody has dogs in their backyard or having a picnic. I don't think if you would like to have somebody having picnic in your backyard or, or, or having uh, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, picket balls or, or, or the restaurants or just the walking trails. I don't think a lot of those, uh, us people living on those streets will vote for having a parade of people just walking on our backyards just because the golf course is facing our backyards. So it, I would like you guys to consider uh, on what is it that's going to be developed and consider that we are there and I wouldn't like to have somebody having a picnic in my backyard. 
with their dogs playing ball. I don't know that I like that. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Greg Galanis. You guys know me by now. So um, I have one question and then a comment. Um, this is great. And the presentation was great. And it, it kind of mirrors and reflects um, Mr. Hurd's proposal in um, um, presentation from um, a year ago. So the question is, have you dimensioned this by revenue and cost? Uh, and if not, could you? So in other words, the cost to develop it and potential revenue associated with, with each category. I guess the quick answer is, is this is the first step to get there. So this is just the program. So these are the ideas that, that we're recommending that go on the, on the property. Then as we move through the master planning process, that's where we'll start looking at elements fit on the, on the site. What does it cost to, to build these? What are partnerships or how do we enter agreements in you know, funding? the opportunities for that so that that those are the next steps this is this is the first step great thank you i think that's important um not just representing the golfers but representing taxpayers the amount of revenue certainly recreation isn't always um, required to make money but we're into it for 30 million and we're going to end up 35 maybe 40 million um, the taxpayers are going to expect to see some return for whatever we do um, and the last thing, uh, I wanted to correct uh, a comment that Mr. Ducate made uh, on the Zoom call earlier, um, that the city does not and will not support golf. Um, that, that is not true. Um, in a recent conversation with Mr. Arnell, um, they are open to uh, whatever makes sense and a recommendation um, from this body. Um, and nothing is off the table officially. The other piece to this, it's nice that the city council has weighed in and they have an opinion, but the form of government that the Boca, city of Boca Raton is, is a strong city manager. So coming from Mr. Arnell's office, uh, I think that's a strong comment. And I think if this body takes this information and packages it thoughtfully and are unanimous in your recommendations, it is my opinion that you'll find the city very receptive uh, to um, what you're considering. Thank you. Uh, my name is Harold Chaffee. Um, I think this is well uh, presented. It represents a lot of the, the, the things that we really want to see there. Of course, it has to be narrowed down and, um, you know, and, and, and then finalized. But there'll probably be, you know, there has to be other meetings to this. There'll probably be like two or three, maybe two or three more meetings with the public to find out as we narrow it down and we come to a, a, like a general plan and then we, we just move the pieces around a little bit. You know, I don't think the beach and park is going to build something that's going to really be, really be a nuisance to the neighborhood. You know, if, if they're going to do something, they always do everything that's right. They'll either do sand barriers, they'll do something that basically you won't be annoyed. I mean, they, they, they're they very receptive. You know, everything they've built is beautiful. You know, the, uh, the other thing about the, the, those large nets that uh, Dick Kate had mentioned, I think it's just a scare tactic for him. You know, the way that the driving range will be laid out, will be, it won't be a nuisance to anybody. If anything, any long, maybe three years ago, we talked about the you know, shrubbery, stuff like that. There's other ways to basically to prevent things, you know. But we need other meetings. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm very happy with the way it's presented. You know, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. I'm getting old. <laughs> I don't know. Angelo Sands, 7348 East Country Club Boulevard, Boca 33487. I have a question concerning, yeah, I mean, this is, this is fantastic. Thank you. Okay. But I, I do have a question concerning uh, how you weigh things. 
uh, you mentioned that you had 10% return. I'm an econ student, so, <laughs> okay, statistics. And uh, that was a great return. We know that in politics, because if you get 10% of the city voting, that's a big deal, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, is it weighed differently as far as somebody sending in a, um, a ballot, okay, as opposed to someone showing up at a meeting and saying the same thing? Are they weighed the same or are they weighed differently? So, the, so each of the categories, each of the you know, data points, either the workshop, the survey, the open survey, the interviews that we had, we weighed each of those categories equally, okay? So, so but the elements that came from each of those surveys or point of contacts if, at the workshop or the interviews and such, we only included the elements that were mentioned by more than 10% of the respondents or the participants. So, so again, there were quite a few outliers of just people who had different ideas and such, but that's how we really kind of called it down. So we, so we had a workable group on the, uh, to develop the program. So that, does that answer your question? Well, you know, maybe for somebody that's in statistical analysis, it does, okay? But let me give you an example. We had, what, 200, 250 people uh, attend that meeting. You had 500 people at, uh, send in surveys, correct? Okay. My question is, were those weighed the same? as far as your evaluation process, as far as where, you know, what was going on. In other words, if you have 500 here, 250 here, what happened here, what happened there? Are those two sample groups being weighed the same? A, so, okay, so this is maybe an easy way to explain. The 250 people, each one at the 250, uh, at the workshop, okay. Each buddy, everybody kind of had a vote on different things, yeah. okay. And then in the statistically valid survey, there were 566 respondents, and there's kind of one vote for all the major issues there. Um, so we didn't wait like one vote in the workshop wasn't equal to one vote at uh, from the survey. What we did is looked at of the 566 respondents from the survey. Let's use that one. That's round numbers, 50, 500 Whatever. survey response, yeah, right? I, I just... Yeah. So, so what we did is we broke that down into percentages. So all, everybody who participated in the workshop, we measured that as a percentage of the participants in the workshop. So if 500 people said, yes, I want pickleball in whatever, whatever it is in the workshop, that was very highly rated because that was 100%. Anybody who said, I want to... Uh, crochet class or whatever it was, right. there was only one person that was one over 500. Okay. Okay. So it's 0.02%. Right. Okay. So then we just looked at that as a percentage of statistics. And then the survey, we looked at those numbers, those votes over the, the denominator was the total participants. So that's how we arrived at those percentages. Okay. Let's, uh, let's say we had 250. Mm -hmm. 250 people show up, 250 send in ballots, okay? Was the same uh, numerical uh, weight given to both groups? Exactly the same weight. The outcome based upon percentage of the total participants. So the denominator, when we calculated the 10% for respondents uh, from the data points, the, the inputs were based upon the denominator. Okay. So if it was 500, if there were a hundred respondents that said, if yes, the or, 250 mm -hmm. voted exactly the same, right. Are you saying the numbers would reflect that exactly the same? Well, that's, that's yeah. why I, oh, excuse me. I want him to answer the that. five, okay. five minutes is, is up. up. Yeah. yeah. Five minutes is up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay? Thank you. I've heard that one.
So Celebrity 6200 Northwest 2nd Avenue, Boca Raton. Um, I like what Mr. Chappie said. Everything that I'm sure almost everyone wants is up there. Um, there's going to be some type of elimination. There's some type of line item cross out, veto or something or whatever. Um, you guys, I gave you a very soft sell, very friendly sell. Somebody should address the elephant in the room. I want to see something as well as the rest of the Boca Tica residents. And Mr. Chaffee does, he has a thousand signatures. I know because I helped get him. I was a founding member of Keep Golf in Boca. So is Mr. Duquette. However, Mr. Chaffee, myself, Mr. Duquette, we all don't agree on everything, but I'm sure we could join forces again. Um, and I'm sure the legal presence here, your legal counsel can come up with an argument. And I, we don't want to, I, I don't want to, I'll be a one man army. I want to know, I want to see something writing about the deed restriction. And I want you guys to know we did pay dues for years to keep that deed restriction or to get that deed restriction. I think that should be addressed. And I also think um, those scenarios and one for one, and I think you guys really should have a meeting with the people that have gonna have some kind of say, and that is Boca Tica. Whether other people agree with Mr. Chaffee or myself or someone else, there will be some type of wall if everything that we want or don't want is just ignored or not line item vetoed. You have some things in there that, uh, a young lady came up and said, you know, I don't want that in my backyard. And you're like, well, you know, it's not about you. You know what? Sometimes it is about us because of a deed restriction. It's very hard to get. We have one of the best ones. There could be litigation for years. We don't want that. But I'm letting you know now, and it's very soft sell. I think you should address us as a meeting. And Mr. Chappie doesn't represent all of us. And that being said, yeah, we're making progress. I like what's up there. But if you want to please everyone, get a little piece of everything, all the surveys and all, um, you know, certain things, I don't see anything about a buffer zone. A buffer zone and a picnic area combined, that is not a buffer zone. We, I'm sure everyone wants a buffer zone. A buffer zone, meaning it don't cross these trees. Something. It's going to be a give and take. We know that. And we, we're looking forward to working with you, but whatever your normal course of business is, I'm asking for a little diversion because we don't want to have obstacles. Thank you. We're, we're addressing the presentation itself. If there's other things that need to be addressed, we can adjust those at a later date, but this is on the presentation well, just, itself and only things that Miller Leg can deal with. Please. I just want to address the comments that were made prior. Okay, the deed restrictions in perpetuity with the land. Okay, it always stays with it. It'll never come off the land. Okay, the beach and the, um, the 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 situation is that you cannot you cannot create a, a restriction on a municipality. Okay, that's what you're going to do. They're not going to do anything different. We chose the beach and parks because they have a charter. The charter tells them what they can do with the land. It can be used for recreation. It can be used for a lot of other things. They can give, grant, lease, convey. They can't get the property away. Okay, they have to use it, you know, according to their charter. So th th that's the situation. It's very simple. If we would have went to the city and they would have bought the land, they could get, they could divide it, they could do anything they want, and they went back into, into, into a lawsuit to enforce the, uh, the, the deed restriction. We didn't want that. These people here understand that. We've gone through this three or four times that we should understand it, you know? Right. Well, like I said, we, we have a, you, you can call our lawyer up. Okay. Well, that, that's what it is. I don't want to argue over here, but anyway, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Anybody else?
Regina Eklund, 5201 Northwest 2nd Avenue. I'll make this quick. Uh, I, I love the list. Uh, a lot of this was in Mr. Hurd's RFI. Um, I also submitted an RFI, which contained a lot of these elements. So the survey, I think, substantiated what we were coming up with. The one thing that I would like to say, and I do seriously hope that the commissioners and Miller Lake will make the golf course a priority. And for this reason, you have over 200 acres of ground there. You are not going to get 200 acres in the city of Boca, anywhere else. No one is going to give it to you. No one is going to sell it to you. All you have to do is look around the city and you see the number of developments and housing that are going up. Green space is at a premium and you have it. A golf course and a driving range are going to need at least 70 to 100 acres. You're not going to get 70 to 100 acres anywhere else in the city of Boca. Take advantage of it now. A lot of the elements and amenities and facilities on this list require a lot less space. They can go to, and on the Ocean Breeze property, they can go at Sugar Sand Park, they could go at some of your other parks or smaller properties that you may acquire in the future. This will be your only, only opportunity to create a golf course. And we need a short course, we need an executive course. I played at the executive course at Boca Muni. It closed and our league was forced to go and play at Kings Point in Del Rey. It is a par three course. They have an executive course. Um, the par three course, that is on, um, oh my gosh, I'm having a brain. Uh, the par three course on A1A is really not an executive course. So I ask that you create something of that caliber um, and you will have players. So this is your opportunity to do that. Do not lose it. Thank you. Anybody else here? No. Okay, online. I have one person who um, whose speaker is not working, so I said I would read this in for her. This is Leanne Weatherford. I don't have her address, but we'll get it. Um, she wrote, Yamato Scrub is across the interstate on Clintmore and has a lot of space. I don't know if there needs to be another nature's preserve so close. Along those lines, there's a ton of room there adjacent that could be designated as a dog park with zoning changes permissions. My speaker does not work, so I cannot comment further. Great presentation, by the way. Good evening, Leslie Roth. Please unmute, state your name and address. You have five minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, my name's Leslie Roth. I live at 6000 Northwest 4th Avenue in a private home on the golf course. I'm one of Jackie's neighbors who spoke earlier. And I agree with her that we must have some kind of a buffer behind our homes. Um, when the golfers would walk by, it was fine because they were just in small groups and you know, the only time they ever really came on your property is if they had a bad shot and they were looking for their balls. Um, what I really don't want to see are large sport groups with bright lights behind our homes um, with large crowds and, uh, you know, noise. I know that sometimes picnic pavilions sound great, but then they bring large parties with boom boxes and it gets very boisterous. The uh, nature trails, I, I love that idea. I think walking trails and bike trails, something passive, maybe with the exercise equipment that goes along with it. I, um, I think a playground for the kids would be great, but we really must be considerate of the homes and the people who live on them. And that is my two cents. Thank you.
Excuse me, Mr. Ducate, state your name and address, and uh, you have five minutes. Hello, yes, Robert Ducate, 5351 Northwest Third Terrace. Um, I did not hear any mention of the height of nets or poles that would buy, that would be uh, adjacent to the uh, golf course. Um, like I said before, uh, Top Golf and other uh, facilities with the driving range typically have 100 foot plus high nets. And I can assure you that Everhoes property, that net's gonna be behind, those people are not gonna be happy. So I think those kind of details will make a big decision on uh, the popularity of a golf amenity, whether it be a driving range or a short course or whatever it might be. And most importantly, uh, as I stated previously, the city council has to approve this. The city council has repeatedly said they're not gonna approve a golf course. So, and if you just keep having that as one of your items, uh, nothing gets done. So uh, hopefully something else will get done uh, and everyone who wants to have the golf course be happy waiting 10 years if that's the case. So again, I'm not against the golf course. I'm against delaying this another you know, five, six, seven years. But again, I think that uh, you're, you're gonna be uh, uh, um, mildly surprised if it's disclosed at the last minute, we gotta put up a hundred foot nets between the railroad tracks and the golf facility. I think your uh, popularity of uh, a golf facility will quickly wane. Thank you. All right. Julia Phelps, please unmute, state your name and address, and you have five minutes if you'd like to speak. Um, can anybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my, my biggest question is, there's several sections to uh, this large property. There's the large section that's next to the railroad, and then the two large sections that are next to I. 95. Is there any plan on the sections that are adjoining I-95 to get a noise wall? The noise from I-95, if you're playing golf or walking out there, is deafening. And I wonder how much enjoyment anybody could possibly get from a nature walk with no um, wall. They're, they're right now rebuilding Clint Moore Road that should have been in the Clint Moore Road plan, but it's not. And I'm wondering if the uh, if the commissioners are just going to not say anything about that, or they're going to say that'll be not in the plan. And I'm just curious about that. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, nothing has been decided on that. Uh, we have no control over the Clint Moore Bridge reconstruction. Um, so we'll have to discuss this in when we see what kind of things we're putting in what areas. Good evening. My name is Sandra Mueller, 6161 Second Avenue. I look at this and I think it's very nice and a lot of work went into it. But I have one question. What do you do with all the cars that are gonna go in there? There's no walking there. You have to put up a garage. You have to put up space for people to put their bicycles. You have to do all this. The inner problem of this is the biggest one. Where do you put up buildings and what do you do with the parking? And what do you do with the dogs? We don't have dog, we have dog restrictions on our place. I don't want a dog there if I can't put one in my apartment. So what am I doing with the dogs? We have to, we have to get the money interest in this. We have to figure out how much it's gonna to cost to put up a garage. We can't just leave it open space because the garage is, you know, Clintmore alone. You know, where do they come open? And then you have all this parking. Nobody's being practical. I mean, we have, this, is a, this is a nice dream, 
But let's get practical about it. Where would you put a, a, a center? Where would you put the walking? Where would you let people ride their bikes? Across the, across the road? I mean, we have it underground years ago because the, the statistics of crossing the road there is gonna be dramatic. So let's figure out where you're gonna do all this and how much is it gonna cost? We've been through this for seven years. Anybody give me a price? Give me a price on where we're gonna put the center. Where are we gonna put this? Where is it gonna look good and why? I mean, this is passive. I don't understand passive. Passive is yes or no. Golf courses, yes. Social, yeah, this is all very dreams. Give me reality. Where do the cars park for the golf? Where do you put the guys or ladies or kids that want to play golf and we need a room for them to put their golf, their cars. We get realistic, give us some prices and then we can really talk. Thank you. Thank you. So just to address that, I think, so this is the first step in the information gathering where we figure out what programs we will have there and what options we have. And I think Miller Legs next step is to kind of see what we're gonna have, different options, and to arrange those, right? Into a comprehensive plan. And then you figure out, well, how much parking do we need for this, 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 and this? Right, but, but it's based on the programs that we have and how much parking we actually need and where we can put the parking, right? So we need to figure out this first. And then those next, Right, well, exactly, but we don't know how many cars we need. So do we need a nine story parking garage? Hopefully not. Do we need, um, you know, four smaller parking lots in different areas? So I think that's, that's the, the next part of this. Right. Right. And yeah. Yes. Right. Oh, absolutely. And that's the next, that's the, that is the next step. Commissioner Wright is correct. That, you know, we'll be looking at, you know, how those, how these spaces fit in there, as well as the amenities that, that and utilities and infrastructure necessary to support those. Okay. So anybody else, anybody else online? No. Okay. So we are going to close the public comment section so that we can hear from the commission. Who's up first? Well, I have my my initial comment when I first saw the the um, the results from this, not this presentation, but the actual like report that we received. I was I assumed that there would be golf on there, which is totally you know fine with me. Um, I, again, I am totally for whatever the public wants to have there. I was really happy because it did show trails and green space. Um, that was my number one thing was multi-use trails and green space. Um, I think I had a feeling that that's what a lot of um, people in Boca wanted. Um, so that was, um, I was excited about that. Um, I was kind of surprised with the multi-purpose fields. I didn't think, um, I didn't think those would be on there. And then the pickleball, but maybe pe people aren't aware of how much pickleball we're putting over at Patch Reef because this, a lot of this was done before we decided on that. Um, so that's something that I think we need to look at is do we actually want to have pickleball here after we have decided on Patch Reef? Um, so I think those were my biggest takeaways. And like the dog park um, issue, we do have to look into that as well because there is a city ordinance where we can't have um, dogs at a non-designated dog park. So we would have to obviously designate it as a dog park. Um, and, and yeah, so those were my biggest takeaways that um, from the results. Anybody else? First, I wanna thank Miller Leg for the great job you did Okay. You even agreed with me a couple of times. I thought that was fantastic. Um, the one thing that uh, I was gratified to see was the variety of different activities. Um, 
there's a lot of stuff there. We can't, obviously can't do everything that's up there. We're going to have to narrow it down. Um, to the golf people, I just want to say, we've heard you, we hear you, we will continue to hear you, but you have to make your case to city council. Talking to us, there are only three voters here that can vote in a municipal election, okay? You are hundreds, you make a difference, okay? So coming to us, if, to be honest with you, if the city says yes to golf, I'm all for it, all right? If the city says no to golf, there's not much we can do because the city controls a big chunk of the property. And even Ricard's RFI was contingent upon getting approval from the city for the use of certain parts of their property. So th that's got to play into it. But um, I, I just want to make clear that uh, we want to get this going as much as you guys do. And we want to do it the right way. Uh, and that's it. Bob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mike, terrific job of getting all this data uh, scrubbed down. And uh, this was a community wish list. And uh, I think you uh, so aptly put it that there may be other places for some of these places to some of these uh, facilities to be placed. And there's probably no way that we're going to get all these components in this park. Uh, there's no way we're going to do the development of this park all at one time. It's going to be a phased in project. Uh, so, if, if, if there's a possibility of having a, a public private partnership that's uh, available, then certainly would take available, uh, uh, take advantage of that. Uh, as, as I was uh, listening to the audience, I, I I think that uh, everyone should understand that uh, we're sensitive to uh, the neighbors and what we put where. Uh, we want to uh, be certain that uh, we don't uh, have a privacy issue that uh, we're encroaching on. I think that uh, as if I was an adjoining uh, to this property, I would want some assurances to that, whether it's a, and we're not going to put those activities, I, I can't envision putting those activities that would generate uh, encroachment into someone's privacy, like a, um, a, a picnic area right adjacent to someone's residence. Right, that right. wouldn't make any sense no. whatsoever. And Absolutely. I don't think you yes. would suggest that. Uh, I'd be concerned about the security uh, of the, the people who are using the facility, as well as the people who are there after the facility shuts down for the night. Uh, that'd be an issue for me. I want to have the right activity in the right zone, if you would. We have, let's say, four zones if you use uh, Clintmore as a bifurcation of the property. Um, and of course, the, the financial issues. And we're far from figuring out what that's going to be because we don't know what is we're going to put there. I think a golf component, to, to, in my opinion, uh, is uh, pretty evident. And, and uh, if uh, Greg Galanis, uh, uh, I trust that man uh, when he says something, I believe it. And if, if he's talked to Lee Fennell about the golfing facilities and, and Mr. Nell has no issues with it, I believe that. Uh, and uh, secondly, I know that the new golf course uh, itself, initially I think folks may have thought that, um, you know, us putting a golfing facility over at uh, Ocean Breeze would be a, would conflict with what they're doing over at uh, Boca Country Club. Far from it. I think it's going to be an enhancement. You know, it could be that, that we end up having um, the, the one management company doing both courses uh, as a possibility so that we can have some synergy there. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to that, and it probably would make, uh, make sense. Um, there was, a, a, you know, a comment made regarding executive golf course, and, and, and some mention was made of uh, Red Reef Park that's not an executive course within the, the scope of what we're talking about. You know, something at Boca Muni, something that's gone. And, and the lady was right. It's probably 70 to a hundred acres to accomplish what we need to do for, uh, for the golfing activity still leaves a lot of space to do other things uh, with the, uh, the park. 
I, I just have a great deal of confidence in your ability to help us decide where, what goes and what makes the most sense uh, financially, because we, we'll need some component of this to generate some revenue to help us keep our costs down. Sure. And, uh, and, and I think a golfing facility gives us uh, some place for the youth to play and for us seniors to play. And uh, so I think that's, uh, that's important. Uh, I just think, and also, uh, I want to make sure that we address the gentleman's concern about the deed restriction, because I think we've been through that uh, and have covered that, but I, I certainly want to comply with his request that we acknowledge that issue okay. and get that off the table so there's not a concern. Uh, and okay. that's not your responsibility, but ours to take care of that. And, uh, sure. But I, I think that we've got a good start. So long as everybody knows this is, this is just a, uh, the first, shot out of the barrel and we'll start lining out things uh, one where there's duplication of services that we have where we're not permitted to have certain things in in, in the park uh and in, in the golf uh, in the uh, ocean breeze facility but i'm confident that uh, with your guidance you can get us to the point where everybody's going to be satisfied with what we have there well for the most part uh, that, and, I, and i think uh, as um uh, Chair, chairperson said, I, I would never would envision any type of a multi-purpose field or sport out there. And I think that's just because somebody put it on the list right. and there's some things on there that may not even be feasible mm -hmm. uh, to have over there. So my compliments to you. Thanks to the public Thank for uh, addressing th this uh, issue this evening. And just know that we're, we'll take all these things into consideration and make certain that uh, we do what's right by you. And uh, we, we certainly don't want to do anything that uh, anybody would be uh, upset with. We'll certainly try to accommodate uh, these issues that the folks here have brought up this evening. Absolutely. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Mike and Lumi, thank you so much. Okay. It, it was more than I ever expected. I, I, I knew you would do a great job, but I never expected this. This is just amazing. And thank you for including so many of the residents, uh, not only in the visioning workshop, but in the, the surveys. I think that that was just a huge uh, advantage for us to wrap our heads around this. Erin, mm -hmm. um, I'm with you. I, I want walking trails, but I also want something that's going to generate some income to pay for the walking trails and all these other wonderful amenities. So I do hope that we can get some golf for the youth and for the people my age um, to enjoy. And also for the, um, the universities, if they want to participate in some way, that could be a revenue uh, opportunity for us. Um, nobody has made an offer, but there are other options uh, to pay for these things, uh, naming rights, um, different uh, organizations that could come in and, and help us out with the, uh, with the design and what have you. So uh, it's not all going to be taxpayer necessarily uh, generated. Um, I, I just think that we have a great opportunity to put something in our city that is going to be mind blowing. And if everybody will just continue to be patient with us, we will do the best we can as quickly as we can. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot to absorb. Um, yes. Mike, when you started with this process, you know, I, I suggested that we have eight goals and I think you met most of them. Um, we we're looking for the highest quality services, best costs. You, you're, you're helping us on this journey right. as we go. I appreciate the fact that you put it in five buckets. Um, I appreciate the fact that there's something, if you can make that all happen there, God bless you. you yeah. Know, I, yeah. I think the tough part for the community and for all of us is we all know that not everything can go there. Um, let's start with golf. Um, I'm okay with golf. Uh, my, my open question is for golf is it has to complement whatever the city already has. So if it, if that's a portion of the course or the, of the 212 acres, terrific. But I also think that it would, um, you just can't have two competing golf courses. We already went down this path. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it again, but if there's some way to make it unique, better, different, 
I'm all in. Okay. Um, but it has to be really, I think synergy with the city is very important. And so they have to be, this has got to be their idea too. So if they're okay with it and they, they come along with the best ideas, I think we should find a common area to work together on it. Um, you will have to address trails versus golf. You know, the prior uh, Price Fazio design made it very clear. I remember asking the question, I'm all for trails. They said trails and golf don't go together. One or the other. Mm -hmm. So uh, we picked you partly because you showed us a picture of it doing both. Yep. I don't expect that with 212. I think you can, as far as I'm concerned to our homeowner over there, I'd be happy with the force. So right. um, if this can be made into something that covers a lot of these areas, but preserve nature, give the trails, it's very important. Mm -hmm. um, but I also am going to tell everyone there, many people are just not going to be happy with everything. This is public land. It is now public land. So someone could be walking through by your backyard. Uh, to um, seal your Ant it's Anthony's Silvery. Silvery. I thought the North Park was a great concept. You had many elements of it, and I think that is kind of a leading us down a path. But you'd be involved in it, you know. And and I would say um, waving the stick of the you know deed restriction, we can make something bigger, better. This can be bigger, better for everyone, and it will really enhance the homeowner values across the board in Boca Tico. So you're far better off if we all work together and come up with good ideas that are reasonable, rational, and financially sustainable. And so we have yep. to, that's one of the things that we had on that seeking grants and community partnerships, mm -hmm. very important. Um, city elected, very important. But I don't envision us building a parking garage. <laughs> and I don't envision us you know, overusing it. But does that mean there's gonna be parking somewhere? Yes, there is. There's gotta be parking. This is public land. So we're gonna work through those things and it's not gonna make everyone happy. But I think at the end, um, with your help, like you can kind of guide us down this Absolutely. path. And I think we can get to a really, really good solution. We have an opportunity that's terrific. Yeah. So um, I'm glad you're on board with it. I'm glad you pointed out this is just a small part of it. Mm -hmm. We're going to come to some very tough decisions and we won't throw you under the bus. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> somebody <laughs> would. No, it's all right. It's our job. <laughs> It'll be okay, but we'll, we're going to get through these things. The only thing I would last comment I would say is that, you know, we had a, a, a group from the Y um, a year or two ago and they said, in order for anything to happen, you have to have some level of shelter. You know, so there's got to be some kind of shelter sure. out there. You have to have facilities. So mm -hmm. that means bathrooms. Okay. You know, those, and you're going to have to have parking. This mm -hmm. is a, our community requires cars. So yep. those are some big things that will come. Hopefully we can find some partners for all those things. And we can accommodate many of these things. But at the end of the day, um, Boca and Boca Tica will be better off. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Okay, well, thank you very much. And again, I can't say enough about how great the public involvement has been so far. And it's going to be even be better because the next time you're going to start seeing some plans of where things are going to be. And that that's really the next start, step of the process. So, so yeah, yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quickly, we are going to have our um, attorney. Uh, Mr. Gorin, um, address the deed restriction comment um, that was made earlier. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, a couple of observations and some things that you've looked at over the past couple of years. Um, in November of 2020, we actually provided you with a memorandum, a legal opinion on the issue of the deed restrictions. You may remember that opinion regarding the, uh, the ocean breeze deed restrictions that were at the time uh, under discussion. A couple of historical notes, if I can, quickly, if I may, though, that give you some, some backdrop. This district entered into an interlocal agreement in, in May of 2011, initially with the city of Boca Raton. And that document, which is the base document that controlled the future golf course relationship between the city and the district, was later modified uh, in April of 2021. And in April 2021, throughout that document, aside from the fact that the main purpose of the interlocal was to provide for uh, golf, the main purpose and the main interlocal was for, for golf purposes, 
the one of April of 2021 provided for alternate sources of purposes. And that was discussed during the course of Miller Legg's engagement, which gave the open door for looking at other public uses within the public property. Commissioner Ernst is 100% correct. This is publicly owned land. Uh, it is no longer in private hands. It has been acquired through, through deed. And in our opinion, we opined the following. We basically said that under state law and under a Supreme Court decision that was rendered in 1982, when a public entity acquires land for a public use or municipal or public purposes, not through what's called eminent domain, which is the taking of privately owned property for a public use, but by acquisition, by voluntary acquisition, essentially notwithstanding this recorded de declaration, it is our opinion that the district is not legally bound by the restrictions set forth in the, in the restrictions and that the property may be utilized by the district for a public purpose beyond the limitations set forth in the declarations. We did a title search. You asked us to. We looked at that title search. But we also know chronologically that the city, of, that the city um, and, the, and the district have an ongoing interlocal relationship. What's an interlocal agreement for those who are listening from the audience and, and otherwise tuned in? An interlocal agreement is a state authorized agreement between two public entities, this, this in this case between the city and the district, which basically authorizes your future relationship together. When you look at the interlocal agreement, which by the way specifically provides for potentially golf uses throughout that document, uh, not that that's the only issue, um, the city and the district agreed that it was in the mutual interest of the city and the district residents for the district to purchase the property from the seller for development of, rec of recreational and related facilities, which may include golf facilities. And that's throughout the document. That was actually, you modified it in 2021 to make sure that even though you were rec you recognized that the need for solely as a golf use was not going to fly based upon the city's acquisition of its own golf course um, and otherwise uh, the case, that, that throughout this interlocal golf was a contemplated use within the use of the, the those other uses that were given by the district. And as a special taxing district, um, this district was created many years ago, but under the terms and conditions of your interlocal agreement, as well as under your special act, what is a special act? Well, you, you don't exist out of the vapors. You exist because the state legislature created this district. You are not appointed officials. You are public officials, but you're also elected officials. You have a fiduciary obligation under the special act to fulfill its terms, conditions, and provisions, which has certain public use opportunities and relationships. You also asked, as you may remember, that we asked the attorney general a couple of years ago, which we did, whether or not the district could potentially sell property or otherwise dispose of property. And we sought that opinion from the AG's office and the attorney general's office gave us some information about that, which I wanna share with you real quickly, if I can find it. Um, and essentially what the, what the AG's office specifically said was, instead the special act authorizes the district to purchase, lease or acquire property and maintain, operate, or improve it for the specific purposes set forth in the act. That would be your special act. When the controlling law directs how a thing shall be done, that is an effective prohibition against its being done in any other way. Unless the special act is amended to provide otherwise, the district may not sell, lease, or otherwise convey the real property it owns. And we received that opinion from the AG's office, round numbers that came in, um, June 8th of 2020. So in June 8th of 2020, you had some foresight. You said, let's talk, talk about that issue. Let's see if the AG can weigh in and help us to interpret a state statute, a special act. It's a law of Florida adopted in 2003 as a re recapitulation of all prior acts. The amended interlocal agreement occurred in April of 2021 um, after realizing that there was probably a need to upgrade the relationship with the city and make every effort you can to open up the doors of opportunity with regard to uses on the property, which are publicly owned. Then you asked us to look into the issue with regard to the declaration of restrictions. Again, to restate for the record, you acquired the property by purchase, not by eminent domain or what's called condemnation. If the property were condemned by the by the uh, by the district for that for the, its public purposes, there may have been another issue legally. But the Supreme Court of Florida has given us some guidance and specifically suggests that, um, based on the foregoing, our opinion stated at the time we rendered it, which was in November of 2020. Uh, that the declaration of restriction, covenants and restrictions encumbering the property are not legally enforceable against the district and that the district may utilize the property for a public purpose beyond the limitations set forth in such declaration. So when you piece together both the special act that governs this district with its own limitations and its own conditions and provisions, and you look at the interlocal agreement, and you look at the case law, which lawyers like to look at in the context of what dictates what local governments or other governments can do, and you're, you're a unit of local government your, yourselves, your elected officials. Um, and when you acquire that property for public use and public purpose under your special act, 
required it by voluntary acquisition. And those, those deed restrictions, um, although they may have applied in the past, in this particular con context do not. I'm not here to debate the public or debate any, any source with regard to my interpretation of those in my law firm. That's what we told you back two years ago. And we, we said it then, we'll say it again now, because we believe that that's the correct legal answer. Um, and you have been on a pathway to look at the future of that property, uh, its potential future use. You went through a very significant process to engage Miller Leg. That was not a mistake. That was not an accident. That was something that you, that you intended to have happen. You interviewed some highly qualified firms who gave you their presentations regarding what to do or what not to do on that property. Tonight, you've heard a very lengthy, detailed, measured presentation regarding future potential uses. This is one step in a larger direction. Uh, this is not the final discussion. You said that publicly and legally. But to the extent that you have a legal pathway, which I've offered to you in the past, you have it this evening and may implement that as things progress. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have regarding how you got here with a legal basis to this discussion. Uh, Middle Leg has done an exceptional job with getting you to a, an operational side, which is a policy-driven decision which you'll make at some future moment. Uh, but at the end of the day, the legal basis to get there uh, is firmly in place, in my opinion, and our legal opinion as your general counsel. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. <laughs> Can I repeat that? Sure. <laughs> you want the shorter version? I'll do that too, whatever you like. We don't get paid by the word, but we do get paid for the substance. So. so to summarize, we can't lease or sell or convey it. Correct. And we can only use it for public use and recreational purposes right. only. That is correct. And, okay. And these are, again, these are sequential issues that you all asked us to look at, and they weren't by accident either, because you had a purpose. Your purpose was to fulfill your fiduciary duties as, as public servants. And that's why we, that we got to these conclusions as a basis to get to tonight right. over time. Okay, right. good. So thank you for that yes, again. <laughs> okay, so any further conversation on this? No, we're good. Okay, so moving on to number two, additional work, Patrick Park, pickleball and tennis re renovations. Brianne. Thank you for the mass exodus here. Okay, we're going to finish up here and go on to number two. Commissioners, on page six of your agenda packets is a memo written by our facilities manager. It outlines um, two issues that were brought up during this process of planning these pickleball courts at Patch Reef. So um, the first issue is drainage concerns at the tennis courts, which we did not previously know about. Um, staff has made us aware, and we want to address those issues. The second um, work order is for parking lot expansion, which maybe something to add as we as or, or consider adding even in a phase two if we had to but right now we'd like to look at how it could be designed and implemented out there at patch reef so tonight i'm looking for a motion to approve these two work orders in the amount of sixty six thousand six hundred forty nine dollars make a motion to approve the two the work orders for um up to 60 it looks like sixty six thousand six forty nine for those two items Is, is, it, is that's the total amount of the 66,000? It's the total for both work orders, okay. yes. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? He seconded, but any any discussion on it? No questions? No? Okay. Go ahead. Commissioner Ingalls? Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelson? Yes. Vice Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Passage? You commissioners. Approval of payroll and invoices. I'd like to make a motion for approval for seventy thousand four hundred fifty-six dollars and five cents. Discussion. Joanne. Ernst. Commissioner Engel. Commissioner Rollins. Yes. Commissioner Vogel Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Okay, reports and discussion items. Brianne. 
Mr. Sure, just a few updates on some of the projects that we've been working on. The RFP for grant writers is due this Friday at 1 p.m. So we hope to have that on the next agenda as a um, topic to discuss or and recommend somebody. Our audit is close to wrapping up, so they're finalizing that, and we have some final interviews to do with the treasurer and myself, and then they'll be able to wrap that up. The YMCA received keys to the community center at Patch Reef on Friday, so they're gonna start going in there and getting ready to set up. It's hard to believe that summer camp is about a month away, so um, they have to start getting in there and getting set up, and it's um, their camps are already filled up, and um, we're excited to see how that works out this summer. We also have RFPs for the carousel, work as well as Swim and Racquet Center that'll be coming in um, the first two weeks of May. Um, first one is Carousel and the following week is the Swim and Racquet Center lighting and um, surfaces over there. So we're excited about that. Some updates on some of the city projects, the restroom design at, at um, Gumbo Limbo, they were working on that as part of the accessibility. They've actually put that on hold now while we, um, they wanna look back at the parking issues there at Gumbo Limbo, which we discussed a couple weeks ago. So that's on hold. The Red Reef South restroom renovation, um, is going to council for approval on April 26th. And then the Red Reef Pavilion is gonna go to council hopefully in May for approval. It's being reviewed by the city manager. And then pipes and pumping project is continuing to move along. The dewatering line was installed. The main seawater line install and pipe using is scheduled to start early May and they're still on schedule to complete that um, late summer 2022. So hopefully that will be done this fiscal year and we won't be carrying that into the next budget cycle. The other item I wanted to bring up is that we've had some ongoing interest from the school district to partner with them on different projects. And I know Commissioner Rollins has mentioned some of the things that have happened in the past. Commissioner Ernst has been speaking and I'll, I'll, I'll let him weigh on in this, but he's been speaking with the chair of the school district um, board who I think they're open now to talking about um, parameters as far as how the usage would work at any of these partnerships. So it would be a blanket um, usage as far as hours and timelines and I'll let Commissioner Ernst kind of weigh in here at this point to talk about that as a possible future agenda item. Yeah, the after talking to um, Frank Baberry a little bit about the school board and some of the projects they have, they have a number of recreation related projects. There is, um, if you had to price them all out alone, we cannot afford to do all those things. <laughs> There's no question. But there are some things that we can probably help them on with the funding and they could construct them. So, you know, specifically at um, Spanish River High School, their fields are kind of in a mess of a shape and they have no intentions of funding anything on it. Um, there's other opportunities at Omni and other areas, but the, <clears throat> the thing that we all agreed upon was that, um, that we agreed upon is that, as Bob pointed out in the prior meeting, there's some experience with Boca Metal, there's experience with other schools that we, what do we want out of these things? And I think what we ultimately want is for kids to have the opportunity to recreate and that they are there's availability and access after hours. And so in the new environment of a secure um, school system, there has to be an independent access point to these locations. Um, so there's some general thoughts uh, on the whole thing is conceptually, I think we could easily agree upon a master agreement for any work that we do that would say, what are the key things we want? We know we need to have access, um, but just focus on that a master access agreement where we could partner with the school district. Just like we've partnered with FAU and others, we could have a defined framework for it um, that will be signed between the district and the school district. Um, Frank is gonna be in his role for the next year and he, he feels that this is a good opportunity and I agree with them, it's a good opportunity to define something at a conceptual level. And then we can look at those projects and we can probably fund some of those projects to make them happen. And it benefits our community. Uh, so what I'd like to recommend is that um, we authorize um, our council to draft a, you know, take one of our existing agreements. And I think Bob's experience with you know, other areas of what we've been limited on. We start with what we really want with it. And then we iron out some of those details. And if we can get to that point, then we can start talking about the projects and doing them. So to do that, I'll do that. But I want to, I don't know if you want to have discussion on it first or not. Agenda is it for a discussion at the next meeting, like put it on the agenda so you guys could come back in the public and weigh in. 
Yeah. May Madam Chair, just as a matter of legality, certainly the topic is one ripe for discussion by the full board, but it's not agendized yet. The public wouldn't have a right to be heard specifically. It would be something that, that should be legally agendized, but could be the subject of your next, next meeting, for example. But in the context of what you're asking, we could certainly draft a, um, uh, a format interlocal agreement with the school board that would contemplate an, any number of different items if the board so chooses to, to direct us. Wanted to have any comments on it tonight or no? The only comment is, uh, you know, the city has an interlocal agreement with the school district that uh, provides us the access to those facilities by using that interlocal agreement. So um, I, I'm not sure how those would dovetail in together because we're talking about uh, capital improvements probably. And we did that, uh, we did capital improvements uh, without any difficulty with um, non estridge and so it should, but I, I think that we need to be, uh, you know, aware of, of that and, and, um, and, and Craig's own uh, terminology, you know, interface with the city in some way so that they know what we're doing. And, uh, and I think it's a good idea if, if we can gain access to uh, more facilities because we're struggling right now uh, meeting the recreational needs of the community in open space. Um, so district council. I may, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, at the last several meetings, as you know, we were asked by the board to, uh, to look into a benchmarking salary uh, compensation survey and, and present back to the board some type of analysis uh, in some form or fashion. Uh, we have about, <clears throat> we're about to complete that analysis with the assistance of our professional staff here. Um, and we'll be able to present that at the next meeting, the first meeting in May, in the next agenda. Um, um, a memorandum which will set forth some benchmarking for salaries and compensation and benchmarking for the for the assignment that you provided publicly. Um, we've had some consultation with uh, Commissioner Ernst, who's been very helpful in guiding us in the context of the substance and the gui and the, the direction points, which we're happy to address at the next regular meeting of the board. Um, just and secondly, if I can quickly, in the context of the, of the earlier conversation about the um, uh, the issue of potential financial partners in future development of the district's property. We did issue to the board, you may remember this, back in September of last year, a complete uh, memorandum regarding um, you know, public-private partnerships, three Ps, or P3s, depending on what part of the, the world you come from. Um, but, but three P projects are governed by state statute 255.065. We did a lengthy memo that actually talked about what a qual qualifying project was, what the conditions are, what the provisions are, how you treat them publicly and how you deal with responses that come out, et cetera. Those that are solicited and those which are non-solicited non kind of thing. Um, if, if we can, we can ask the director if she can resend re that to each of you to have it. Um, just parenthetically, we as your lawyers have received some calls already from some third parties that have asked us about whether or not this project or a project or any type of project on the site would be a 3P project. We're, we're just your lawyers, but at the end of the day, um, that memo does set forth the script for and the, and the guidelines for getting to the answer at some future moment. We support it. Uh, and to that extent, I would, I would recommend that it be distributed as, as needed to each of you, should you be approached as well with uh, third party folks who might be interested in future development projects. And that's all I have for this evening, but thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Very quick. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Miller Leg, and I'd like to thank the public for uh, their participation. Um, uh, I think we have uh, some insight as to where where we should be going with this, but uh, this is the first of many steps, uh, and I look forward to getting this on the road and getting this done. Uh, I've been on this board since 2013. I've been uh, here for the beginning of this project and I want to be here for the end, but I got to tell you guys, I'm not going to live forever. So that's all I got. Craig. Going back to um, the Sam's comment about the um, payroll and things like that. Uh, in, in that process, uh, I was looking at the payroll uh, calculations and I called into question um, Brianne, the accuracy of some of them. And I think they have to answer some of the questions on it. Um, but I think Brianne has reached back out to the provider and has, you know, 
the responsiveness has been kind of lacking. So you may want to put on your agenda a RFP for the payroll uh, person. And I don't know what that interface is with other parts of the financial. I know Merv is excellent at, at how, guiding us on capital projects and stuff, and he doesn't do payroll. So we kind of have to figure that one out a little bit more. Um, Brianna, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. That was on my list of uh, asks of this board. Um, along with putting out the RFP for insurance for next year, I'd like to do an RFP for uh, payroll services as well. So that'll come forward soon. Thanks for that. And then I, I guess the, the two other items I had is um, if you could expand upon um, the canopies at Sugar Sand, I didn't hear any mention of that, but I, I think they were installed. And what's the, what's the direction? Of, is, that, or is everyone happy with the roller rink over there or not? They did do a test sample and they liked it. Um, they're gonna find, they have to finish, they have to get the product now to cover the whole whole um, uh, roller hockey rink. So they're gonna or get that ordered and, and I don't have the timeline yet, but that's in the works. And everybody was happy with two coats, not just one coat, but two coats was what they preferred. So they've got to order the product now and get that out there. The um, canopies are installed and will be up. And also another outstanding item that we are still working on is the parking issues at Patch Reef. And, I have to thank Melissa for working with the city staff. And then I've talked to Michael as well and sent some um, wishes uh, through email. So hopefully they're, they're gonna continue to address that and get the equipment moved out of Patch Reef in that front parking area. So we'll continue to work on that. Talking at Sugar Sand, if this board's okay, I would love to go out to Sugar Sand with Mr. Pratt there and walk it to see if we could do the, uh, the golf, the disc golf there and I'm from my perspective if it could be ADA accessible and we could design it that would be really cool but we have to explore that one and if this group is interested in pursuing it I think that's a good add to the park um, any thoughts on that my concern is this it's this a protected scrub area so um, I would I would prefer not to have any concrete paths put through there, although I would love it to be able to be ADA compliant. Um, it is a protected scrub area, environmental scrub area. So um, we'd have to look into that more to see um, exactly, you know, <laughs> where where it is and and to see um, if a if a course can be put in there without disturbing the area. Um, I, I think that's one of our main goals for Sugar sand is to protect that space that we have to be untouched. Maybe so. if we get a map of it, and then we'll we'll look for the areas that are not, you know, that are yeah, make, I, make I, sense. I'm, wherever that is, I'm 100 percent on board looking okay. into it and see if it's something that we can actually do. And especially if it's like a fun, challenging course throughout like a wooded area that's shaded, versus like out in an open field in South Florida in August. A lot of people probably won't use it, but if it's shaded in a wooded area, I feel like that people would use it. And if we're not disturbing the scrub area in that process, I think it would be a great place for it. That's my opinion on it. We'll, we'll take a walk. We'll, we'll, I'm not a disc player. I'll, I'll throw the disc once, but, but, <laughs> but we'll, we'll look to see where we can incorporate it there or where else. We'll just kind of explore options. But if we could get a map that says, here's the areas that don't make any sense. We, we'll work around that. I think we can, we can figure this out. So, security at, at Ocean um, Breeze. That is very concerning. <laughs> I mean, no one should have any guns or anything on a um, public land. So I'm curious to see what those, um, what the signage is. I'm not a big fan of signage, but I do think signage is important when it comes to, you know, trespassing and things like that. And I, I mean, it's also be guided with this is public land. So um, putting up no trespassing signs is kind of hard is a balance. We have to find that right balance, but there is no room for destruction of property or guns or anything that is what we heard at the beginning of this conversation to me warrants um, you know, significantly more action only because the, you know, I get it. Uh, if you call the police, they say, it's not my prop, not your property. You can't do anything, but the police should have full authority to arrest anyone with a gun on a public park. And if it's, if you need a sign posted up that says no guns on 
public park, I'm all in uh, to, to do that. It's not quite a park yet, but um, we should have a good conversation with our brothers and sisters at the city that uh, we look for their help to um, you know, police this area because it, 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 that's totally unacceptable. So. In, in response to your comment, it, it is a city issue in great detail. There is currently pending in the Florida Supreme Court a case that was filed by a number of counties in, in Florida and a number of cities challenging a section of ch state statute, ch chapter 790. 790.33 is a statute currently under review by the Supreme Court. Um, it is a provision which essentially suggests that the legislature has taken preemptive control over gun management and gun control in the state of Florida. And because of that, local government officials who otherwise would seek to, pre to take action uh, in, in, in light of that preemption suffer a potential financial penalty can be imposed by the governor and can be, can be enforced by the courts and could also include the removal from office. That specific punishment section, the, the penal section of the, uh, the punitive section of the, of the statutes currently under review by the Supreme Court of Florida. Uh, our law firm is part of that, that process. There must be 30 different cities and counties involved in the litigation. Um, the first district court of appeal in Tallahassee considered it about a year ago, almost a year ago, and it was um, uh, partly successful, partly not, but the case then went on further. It's now currently pending in the Supreme Court. So when you speak of signs that otherwise ban firearms, we need to be mindful of the fact that that very issue is kind of in, in controversy right now in, in the state. It's in play. Um, I don't disrespect your opinion of that of the speaker who spoke earlier, um, but I would choose to, to, to tell you that it does affect local officials. I'm not sure how much it affects you, but if you own publicly owned property and you post no, no, um, uh, no, no, yeah, no, whatever, trespassing may be the better answer, but the end result is there, there is currently a case pending, which may give us some further guidance, but it is a, an issue that the local officials in, in, in the Boca Raton City Council would have to address because they're the ones that could lose their, their position by, by what they may do legislatively. You don't get to legislate. You don't, you don't create laws in, in, in the district, but they do. But your issue is well, well taken. This case may give us some direction, hopefully. Or the city police handling it, the state coming in with whatever rules they have, they can do it. But I'm rules. also one of the, um, you know, living through Parkland, I, I'm okay with doing whatever we can do to That's prevent um, random acts that don't belong. And so I think we, we have to be very proactive if we have, if we can be within the scope of everything. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be proactive in discussing this with our police department and as much as possible. Um, but I, I would say just be as diligent as possible. If you have seen those people out on the property, call the police, tell them they're there because we aren't out there all the time. We can't be out there all the time. Um, so if you see them, call, call and just keep calling if you continue to see them. Um, and we'll do our part. Um, on that same subject, uh, are we talking about, uh, is there a distinction between firearms and guns, Sam? No, the answer is that under, under chapter 790, which is a bill passed, it's been modified over the years, but it, there's language in that, in that statute, which specifically says that the, that the, control and management of, of guns and ammo are essentially preempted to the legislature of the state of Florida, not to the governor, not to elected officials, it's to the legislature as a whole. Um, and that statute was amended several years ago to provide specifically for this penalty provision, um, which scared the hell out of a lot of public officials who would otherwise act in violation of it because it has two components, one of which is a $5,000 fine. It also included a removal from office by the governor and it also provided that in an action taken against the local government that the winner of the lawsuit would get attorney's fees that were uncapped, which meant that there was no limitation on fees or costs that could be assessed in the event a judge would rule against the local government official. So the risk of that caused like a, lot of, a lot of local governments in the state of Florida to challenge that ordinance, the state, the state statute, forgive me. Um, and it's now before the Supreme Court. It may not get to be heard until the latter part of this year, um, but it's a very serious case with some very serious ramifications. Um, Florida is not yet an open carry state, but there were bills that were filed this past session that opened up that door, as a matter of fact, regarding open carry. Um, it's not, not like the Texas statutes or otherwise, which are open carry states, but there are some very significant protections for gun owners and those who control that particular environment. So I raise it only because you've asked the question. It's a serious point of reference. 
because it is a pellet gun uh, one of the a firearm within the context of what you're talking about? I'm not a specialist in that area. I can't answer that this evening, but I know that 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 it, 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 it probably does include many different things, but it could include that as well. I, I just have a hard time believing that the, our boys in blue would ignore somebody with a firearm that. on our property. Uh, I, I, re I really can. Now, I, I've, I've seen folks yes. with pellet guns taking yes. out these iguanas, uh, but uh, that doesn't present the... Uh, that these people are still trespassing. We need to put a stop to them getting their vehicles on the course. I'm not sure where they're coming in, but I think that if 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 they have access and they're probably in a four wheel drive vehicle, we need to put some type of obstacles there that makes it inconvenient for them to try to access the property that way. And I turn that over to uh, facilities and to our uh, manager, uh, our executive director rather, uh, and, and other. Uh, issues. It's good to see Harold and Barbara back with us uh, after uh, you know lengthy illness that Harold had. It's nice to see you at the uh, the microphone, Harold. And uh, Barbara, you take better care of yourself as well. I heard about your incident uh, and, um, and Angelo as well. It's just good to see you folks out there, uh, you know, and it's good to see the audience uh, busy now that we've gotten past the pandemic and you know we're feel free not to wear a, a mask um uh, it's your own choice um spanish river uh i'm, I'm sorry uh, sugar sand park the roof over there brian did what what are we doing with that we're researching to see what all needs to be done from facilities and then putting together um an rfp to go out for that Okay, because you know I, I've talked to some uh, contractors, and and these roofs, uh, you know, if you have um, leaves or pine needles dropping on there, sometimes you can end up getting the acid in there, corroding this, and then there's really no way to fix those kind of things. Uh, you can paint over, it, but it's not going to uh, get the job done. So that's the reason why I was asking that question. Um, as far as the um, um, I've I've walked uh, when we purchased uh, the um, Sugar Sand Park. I walked that property, um, and uh, it, it's it's a very unique property. And I know that the city has a map that shows the environmentally sensitive part of that uh, area. Um, it, it, when we uh, first got in there, we were planning to put the carousel over in the northwest corner of that park, and it was decided that was environmentally sensitive. And um, when Don Capron was on our commission, uh, God rest his soul, he was one of the original commissioners, um, mentioned uh, he was afraid that uh, we were going to jump from one lily pad to another lily pad and not have a place to land because of all the scrub areas that were there. And there was originally designed a, um, a water feature adjacent to the uh, science playground. And that was ruled out because of uh, uh, some environmentally sensitive property. So it would be a challenge. But uh, I'm certain that, uh, you know, uh, with Miller Legs' help, if our, our, we, we could find some way to uh, put a path through there. And as the gentleman said, probably it's, it, you're not going to be able to get a regular wheelchair in there, but there's chairs that have the bigger tires on them like they do at the beach to get down the beach. And that might be something that uh, would make it a, a ADA accessible, uh, be a little more of a challenge for someone if, if they didn't have that, but uh, not a bad idea. Um, finally, Sugar uh, Sand Pine Park, uh, one of the fields are open. Uh, so uh, I've been on the field. I, I, I must say I like our um, infield better. Uh, it's softer, friendlier. Uh, and uh, even though it requires a wetting down occasionally, I, uh, I'd like that. But the good news is it's open. Uh, play is taking place on it. The West Field is still closed because I think it's still part of the construction that's going on there with the restrooms, but that's a that's a, a good thing that it's open. The rest of our fields and in our inventory have taken more wear this season than I've seen ever before, and I think it's because, one, there's more people after the pandemic recreating. Um, it, even the field, the, the game field over at FAU has taken a pounding. Uh, the glazed fields are worn more than I've ever seen them before. And Spanish River, in spite of the city's best efforts rotating, it still has taken a lot of a uh, lot of a uh, lot of usage to the point where they are actually scheduling um, small-sided uh, games on the outfield 
there at, at the baseball diamond over at uh, Sugar Sand. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, at uh, Spanish River Park. So the city's done a really good job, uh, you know, with with the maintenance and scheduling folks around that, but which speaks to the need for them uh, to get moving on uh, phase two over to Hornley uh, because it's sorely needed. And I, I know we have a, a city council election coming up and is there anybody besides Mr. Thompson that's termed out uh, that's going to have to resign to run for office? You know, Brian? Yeah, I was, I was going to recommend uh, my fellow commissioner to think about replacing Andy. That way we have somebody on the inside uh, who could help us with this golfing. I think, I think Miss O'Rourke is termed out, isn't she? Yeah. I believe she is. Okay, yes. well, there, all right, Susie, there you got two people here. Now, we would miss you over here, but we would be happy to have your support over at City Council. <laughs> yeah. Are you, oh, you're... Okay, well, uh, no, <clears throat> listen, I'm, I'm termed out. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for entertaining uh, my humor this evening. And, uh, and thanks again for the great job, Brianne, that you're doing uh, for us. And Mike, I, I'm so impressed with what you, you and your staff have done in putting this together. And, and I know that the project, as Craig said, uh, is going to be an asset to the community, uh, public property, and we're looking for it to be the custodians of the final large open space over there. We want to make sure that it's designed properly and, and it supports the recreational needs of the community and serves the and increases the value of the area in which it's being located. So thank you. And Sam, thank you. I'm in, in the thank you mood tonight. <laughs> Yeah, well, now it's it's good to have have the resources on here. You must have anticipated this. Uh, okay, well, you you, it's uh, I'm you're gonna get your eagle badge from this tonight. Okay, <laughs> all right. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Susie. How do you follow up after Bob Rollins? <laughs> I do have one question about our district policies about. Um, how we invest our money. Uh, my husband and I have been talking about these I-9 bonds uh, possibly increasing from uh, the restriction of just investing $10,000 to possibly $100,000 and them paying 9%. And is that a possibility? We don't necessarily have a policy within the district that we might have to institute or do we, Craig? Bonds, you're correct. It's currently at the $10,000 limit, and it's proposed to go to $100,000. It's a very attractive thing because it follows CPI as it goes up. Everyone should consider it if you have excess cash because it doesn't go below zero, but it will be adjusted. Um, and there are some restrictions on it too. So if it goes up significantly, that's more possible. For the district though, um, I don't think those are open to incorporated um, it's more for individuals. It was, it was always intended to be an individual um, I bond. Um, the concept was individuals, but we can, I think it's something we can look into, um, but it, it's too limiting. Ours is millions of dollars. And the safest thing to do is have it in one place, which is the Florida you know, SBA. Um, interest rates are rising. That's a good, good thing for our, um, our assets rapidly. Um, not good for the general community or home buyers, but it is very good for us and we should see a large uptick. Um, but this, there's a window here, the last three months have been negative. I'll be honest with you. That's not a, a very good message for our returns. So I'll take a closer look at it. I'll uh, look into see if buy bonds are a possibility, but I wouldn't recommend it really for the district assets. Individually, it's terrific. And I can give you some material on it nominated you as treasurer because you are always you always have your your hand on our our bottom line so that's that's great um there was another thing that i i recently read about was that loggerhead marine center is losing its its staff are we going to be impacted at gumbo limbo as far as an influx yes i've actually talked to john holloway from the coastal stewards because they run the turtle rehab program. So I think that they are trying to help out as much as they can with those sea turtles. But I think we'll see an ongoing um, 
impact for sure from that. And I'll talk to John more about that and, and find out what they're doing and how they're doing it. But I know he's already reached out to them to talk about what they can do to help some of the turtles. If you could report back on that, because I think that's going to be something since this is turtle season. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's your turn. Okay, well, I have nothing to report on tonight. So just a thank you to Miller Leg for the presentation um, and for answering the public's questions as best you could. And I think we're all really looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. <laughs> Um, okay, so future agenda items, the salary and benefits analysis, the ocean strand operational costs, um, grant writer recommendation, the Gumbo Limbo Tower project and ADA parking, and the school district projects uh, partnership. Was there anything else that anybody wanted to add on to there? And the payroll. And I think that's it. Um, so, Joanne, or we need a motion. Sure. Commissioner? Yes. Commissioner Engel? Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Lowenthal? Yes. Commissioner Rank? Yes.